step into a world where the paranormal takes center stage. Paranormal M is your backstage pass to real encounters with the supernatural. Don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell to join us on this thrilling otherworldly adventure. The second room in the basement. I've never really had any reason to be truly scared. And looking back, there isn't one experience I can think of that truly terrified me. I've jumped countless times from sudden loud noises or catching something move in my peripheral vision. But I cannot really ever fully say that I screamed or I shouted. But maybe that's because I'm not a very outspoken person anyway. And I'd rather mask my feelings from others. I lost my eldest daughter once. She was two, and we were in a B&Q. It's a hardware store. They have model bathrooms and kitchens there. And there, I'm admiring some taps or tiles or whatever it was, and I turn around to the shower, and she was m just messing around in there, and then poof, gone. That was pretty terrifying, but I wasn't scared, more frantic. Here's the full disclosure. I found her taking a dump on one of the display toilets. Not my proudest moment of having to tell the employee that they needed to clean up in aisle six. Anyway, so I have never really been terrified. Except once. It happened back when I was 17. I'd left school that summer and had six weeks before starting college. It was baking hot in the small rural town that I lived in. Situated pretty much in the middle of England. It's an old coal mining town and a bit of British, or British history here. All the mines were closed down, which disseminated both the economy and job opportunities of the small pit towns throughout the country. Back to my town. If you're old enough, or at least old enough to spend your time, you know, you'd spend it in the local pubs. If you're not into having anything else to do, you'd just roam the streets seeking your own entertainment. Me and my friends were the latter. On the main road through town, away from other houses, stood a dilapidated house known as the O'Briens, a four-story, six-bedroom mansion compared to all the other houses in town. There was an old couple who lived there, who at this point had passed away some years prior, and it was called, you guessed it, the O'Briens. They had two daughters who had moved abroad and had never claimed the house, so it just sat for years. Building just dust and rotted away. Perfect opportunity for somewhere cool, private, and exciting for six teenagers to hang out. The house had a ridiculously big backyard, which was equally ridiculously overgrown. It literally took us a good part of the day to stomp down a pathway through the nettles and brush, and once through, there was a garage that we could basically drop down into, which we pulled off the roof of to gain access. We spent nearly all summer in that house, hanging out, graffitiing the walls, drinking, smoking. But there was run or one room that eluded us. From the garage, you headed through a kitchen, which now only consists of a broken window that had been boarded up and a damaged set of cabinets on the back wall. You then stepped into a hallway, which looked right through the front door, with a bathroom and two other large rooms on the left-hand side. On the right were the stairs to the second floor. The staircase was built against a wall and had a wooden plank running vertical. Directly opposite the kitchen door, built into the back of the staircase, was a large metal door that had been painted white. The paint, now a sickly yellow dusty color and flaky. This door was locked. It simply wouldn't budge, and looking at the hinges, it opened inwards. The house was big enough that just kind of forgot about the locked door. We'd spend most days up in the two rooms of the third floor, away from the roadside outside, to avoid any passerbys hearing us and phoning the cops. That was until one of the lads decided, for no apparent reason, to light the moth-ridden curtain on fire with a zippo that he was messing with. The curtain, dust-covered carpet, and old crinkled wallpaper went up in seconds, we only made it out by smashing the top window and jumping onto a dirt mound on the right side of the garage. I think if adrenaline hasn't been coursing through us, it would have been a hell of a painful fall. We hid in some bushes over the road and watched the fire engine pull out and put out all the flames. But before that could even happen, it engulfed the second and third floor, 
The second was still usable once we had the courage to re-enter the house, but the third floor was gone. Just the outer walls and what was left of the roof. Shame, really. So we were confined to the bottom floor. The garage was too dark to see in and only had an old table. And you'd normally use that to put paste on wallpaper. We used it to get in and out of the roof. The kitchen wasn't much brighter, and the front room had a big window that overlooked the footpath and the road outside, so that left us a small, bleak back room to chill in, which got boring very quickly. Boredom led to curiosity, and I noticed that one of the wooden planks on the side of the stairs was loose, and that there was an open space behind it. Finally, we could see what was behind the metal door. What a mistake that was. They say curiosity killed the cat, but in this instance, it questioned my whole belief. The wooden panels were surprisingly hard to pull off, even for six fairly athletic teenagers. So we went out scouting and brought back a few torches and a crowbar. It was still a slog, but we finally managed to remove two and a half of the panels. Shining the light into the hole revealed another staircase that led downwards. Yet, it looked as though it was decades older than the rest of the house. Cobwebs engulfed every surface, and the stench of musk and damp attacked your nostrils. If you got anywhere near the hole, that is. After some giddy behavior, some pushing and shoving, and a game of six-man rock-paper-scissors, I grabbed a torch and slowly stuck my head through the hole. The room was darker than dark, so dark that the beam from the torch could be seen cutting through the blackness. I shone it down the staircase first, it went down deep. The hole we had made was maybe four or five steps from the door, and there were at least twenty-five below it. At the bottom, a wall and a doorway to the left. I swung the torch to the right toward the metal door, not expecting to see what I saw at all. The door was definitely locked tight, with three separate deadlocks that ran down the side, all barred. But what caught me by surprise was on the small lip of the top step, pushed firmly against the door. It was a really outdated fridge. The ones that were all squared and about waist high. I told the lads to st stand beside me and they just laughed thinking I was joking. One by one they stuck their head in the hole, checked out the bottom of the stairs, and then the fridge. Each one as confused as myself. I remember sitting down smoking a cigarette and debating how and why would it be there. The door clearly opened inwards which meant the door must have been locked from the inside. Then somehow the fridge put up against it from the inside as well. We spent the rest of the day checking the garage and the surrounding area of the house for a trap door or another entrance or exit to the cellar, but couldn't find anything. We put it down to the sheer size and state of the garden and went home. The next few visits to the house was us trying to decide who would enter the cellar first. No one wanted to, no matter how many games of rock, paper, scissors we played, it was always best out of the higher number, until one day I'd had enough. We were sat in a circle in the other room, messing with stuff and just generally chatting. Except me. I just sat and stared at that hole, this dark void in the wall. Finally, I got up, exclaimed my intentions, took the torch from my pocket and stepped inside. Everyone else quickly and very excitedly followed. Immediately, the first few layers of the wooden steps just disintegrated under my feet. They turned into a mulch of damp splinters that clung to the sole of my shoe when I lifted my foot. It was worrying, but the stairs seemed sturdy enough. Each step I took downwards, the temperature dropped rapidly and the air seemed to get thicker and thicker. The inches of dust that I kicked up didn't help. Admittedly, I was a bit scared, but I had five other lads behind me, so it was impossible to turn tail now. I headed down and reached the second to last step, and I could see the doorway, which led to an open room. Pausing, I regained my courage with a few shaky deep breaths and stepped through. The room was in a worse state than the stairs. Webs littered the rafters and floorboards above like moss. They hung from the ceilings in clumps, all tarnished with dust. And weirdly, thinking about it, we never saw any spiders, though. 
The floor was carpeted in a layer of debris from the rotting wood above, dust and dirt. It was a miracle that none of us fell through the floor above. This place was a mess. The room was huge, expanding underneath the bathroom in both rooms on the first floor, and it was dark. There was no light source other than the torches that three of us carried. The room stood empty except a wooden table, smack bang in the middle, no chairs, nothing around it. But on it stood a metal plate, crudely bashed into shape with the remnants of black goo on it. Next to the plate stood a tall, uncorked green bottle. One of the boys went over and picked it up. It sloshed as he did so, with a liquid of deep brown and layers of dirt inside. I never smelled it, but apparently it was putrid. At first, we didn't see the other doorway. It was just in the corner directly opposite, the one that we had just entered. No door, just total darkness. We tried to shine our torches through it, but they didn't seem to cut through the shadows. It was like there was actually a door there, one that drained the torchlight. For some reason, I didn't muster the courage to go into that room, and neither did anyone else. We simply turned and left, feeling like we'd had enough of an adventure for that day. Over the next week or so, we invited girls and other friends to the house, but all refused to enter the basement. We found this pretty hilarious, and would dare one another, more to show off than anything to go down there either on our own or in pairs without a flashlight and see how long we could stay down there. Now, not once did I get scared while I stood in complete darkness down there. It was kind of calming, but none of us ever got the courage to enter the other room, and in hindsight, we should have questioned more why the door was metal or why it was locked from the inside and how a fridge got up the stairs and placed in the front door as a barrier from the inside also. But, full of excitement and immaturity, it never crossed our minds. We just assumed that there would be some sort of other exit to the other room which led to the garden. Word quickly went round through the year that groups in the O'Brien was in the basement. Well, I guess I'm assuming that people were in their basement, which was us, and we definitely fed the rumors of it being haunted. Teenagers would ask us how to get into the house and for us to show them the barricade and the door in the basement. So, because we thought we were cool, we spent another day making a maze in the garden, squashing pathways down that led away from the garage. We would then invite people into the house, lead them through the garden into the garage, and show them the hole in the stairs. It got quite popular and we decided to cash in on the opportunity. We told people that if they wanted to see the basement then they would have to go through an initiation. As they came in, we would have one person sit on the fridge and another at the bottom of the stairs, both with torches, and send people into the first room, telling them that they had to stay there for ten minutes with the torches turned off, and then we would let them out. This went on for a while, and it was fun at first. A lot of people bottled it as soon as the torches were turned off, I'm assuming that, well, I don't really know what that means, but anyway. But some stayed. We'd cheer them back up the stairs when they completed it. It was a cheesy little ritual that we created, but still, everyone refused to go into the other room when questioned. They just said that they didn't feel comfortable until my little brother and his friend came. They were two, two years younger than us, and initially, we refused to let anyone who wasn't our age into the house. We were all there at the time, and there were six of us in that friend group. So it was pretty easy to deter people away if they managed to find the entrance at the garage. But after constant pestering and the initial curiosity of others dwindling, we decided to invite them along. We made a big deal out of it, taking them to the dilapidated fence at the back of the garden and tying their jumpers around their faces as we led them blind through the maze of shrubbery and thorns to the garage. It was a decent drop from the hole in the roof, and even though my brother managed it, his friend had to be lowered down by his arms. Once inside, they were met with a stench of smoke that lingered from the floors above. We walked them through the kitchen and showed them the makeshift entrance to the basement. We told them the story of the metal door and how it didn't make much sense, 
and it gave them the option of staying in the room. In pitch black for 10 minutes, or go in the second room in pitch black for five minutes, an offer a lot of people initially picked until they got down the staircase. The quote-unquote second room, they said in unison, and we all laughed, expecting them to change their minds immediately. One of the lads slipped through the hole in the wooden boards and turned right, heading up the stairs and positioning himself on the fridge. I went through the next and positioned myself at the foot of the stairs. I'd just like to say at this point, all of us regulars felt completely comfortable going down to the bottom of the stairs practically alone. We'd all taken turns when bringing people down here and had done it numerous times each, so this time was no different. There was a giddy, nervous atmosphere when the two youngsters entered the staircase. The torches that we were using were cheap ones that we'd gotten from the market, so they cast an eerie yellow glow. Slowly, my brother and his friend made it down the stairs, clearly attempting to show face and act unmoved by the state of the rotten, decaying wood around them. But as they trenched through the mulch, they stuck close together. They took their time, so much so that the guy at the top shouted at them to hurry and both nearly shit their pants. When they finally got to me, I told them that this was the first room, shining the torch around the room through the doorway, and that they were to go into the next one, aiming my beam through the darkness to the frame of the other door. The room was a decent size, and as stated, the torches were cheap, but I remember taking notice that the beam that cut through the first room never seemed to illuminate the second room at all, as if there was an object obstructing its path. My brother's friend walked into the room, and as my brother walked past me, I grabbed his shoulder and told him that he didn't have to do this, and if he did, then he could come back out whenever. With a nod and a dismissive wave, he followed his friend. They crossed the room past the table and disappeared through the second doorway, as if walking through a dark stage curtain. I hit the button on my Casio watch to start the countdown from five minutes. I then aimed the beam of my torch up the staircase. The guy sitting on the fridge smiled excitedly and looked at his watch. I really need to piss, dude. I'll be right back he said, jumping down and disappearing back through the gap. I stood at the bottom of those steps for what seemed like forever. I could hear the faint giggles from across the first room. They seemed muffled, as if hearing voices from behind a door. How long left? my brother's voice said. Three and a half minutes, I replied, checking my watch. Now, in the basement, despite it obviously being underground, there was never an uncomfortable temperature. It was colder than upstairs, but had no bite. There was never a chill, and while being down there countless amounts of times, not once had any of us felt any sort of breeze. But, and this is a memory that still haunts me a little bit, especially when there's a sudden shift in temperature, I noticed that I became very cold at the bottom of the stairs, to the point where I could see my breath when checking the time against the light of my watch face. The mumbles from the other room had also stopped. I tried to focus on them, see if I could hear any movement or the nervous noises that they had been making before, but nothing. I remember getting freaked out, and I don't really know what it was about, but I could feel my heart beating faster. The hairs on my arms and the back of my neck stood on end. I turned on the torch and stepped into the first room. Yo, you guys all right? I called out. Nothing, no reply. Oh, stop fucking around, time's up. I called again, and again no reply. I shone the torch through the doorway of the second room, but just like before, it was as if the beam cut through the first room and then stopped at the doorway. I crept closer, calling my brother's name, but he never replied. Then as clear as day, so loud it hurt my ears after the silence, a voice, deep, brash, and distorted, as if the sound had been twisted, bellowed, Leave now. I froze on the spot, eyes fixated on the doorway. Then emerging from the gloom, ran my brother and his friend, both as white as snow, both with tears and snot streaming down their faces. The look of pure terror on their faces is something I'll never be able to get rid of. They bolted straight past me, which snapped me out of the trance and I followed suit. Before we could reach the doorway to the stairs, the 
The sound of crashing came from the stairwell. Four ridiculously loud bangs and the noise of snapping wood. The fridge was embedded into the wall at the bottom of the staircase, and without stopping we all scrambled over it. The staircase itself was a complete mess. Large splinters of wood stuck up like spikes. Luckily, and I don't know how, we managed to clamber up on our hands and feet without injury. Halfway up, I looked toward the hole in the wall, praying that it would be reaching that it would be in reaching distance. Both the young lads were in front of me, both sobbing and screaming. Both ran straight past the hole in the wall. The metal door locked before with no key, and we looked anywhere for it, stood open. Light from the garage exit spilled through the kitchen and down into the basement, as if it showed us the quickest way out. Instinct had set in by this point, and all three of us darted through the door onto the table and up through the garage. My brother's friend, too small to get down on his own, managed to get out without help. We ran through the garden maze, and at some point I had to grab hold of my brother to stop him from going down one of the many dead ends that we had created, and without word, took the lead. We raced to the fence, squeezed through the hole, and collapsed on the field behind the property. I looked around... And there, also sat on the grass, staring at the three of us, was everyone else who had been in the house. No one said a word. Everyone looked as scared as each other. Except for the two younger boys, they wept for a long time. And actually, as we all just sat there in silence, we let them do it. Once they had stopped, we all got up without a word and went home. My brother said nothing to me on the way, or when we got back. He went into his room. I went into mine, and that was the end of that. No one went into the house again, stood for a year or two, and then it was demolished. Apparently, one of the daughters had finally come over and claimed the land, only to sell it to some new build project. Now, a group of houses sit where the garden and the house were. Nice-looking houses, to be fair. My brother still refuses to walk past that estate. They never built on the land directly above the cellar, apparently, and I've never really confirmed it, but the builders refused to fill the cellar in for some reason. They just bricked it up and left it as an open space, despite being able to fit a perfectly good house on there. We only brought it up once within the friend group, and only because I convinced myself that it had once, or that it had been one of them that had opened the door somehow and moved the fridge but they all swore it wasn't. They said that as soon as it started getting really cold in the house that they got spooked. They heard the voice and headed for the kitchen, noticed the door was open, and they heard the loud bangs and bolted. I tried asking my brother about the room, but he completely shut down when I did. He quickly stopped being friends with the kid who went down with him. Said they no longer had anything relevant to talk about. The pictures show the house after the fire, and you can see the smashed window from the fire brigade and the black from the smoke around the top windows. The garage is behind. Can't see it in the photo. The other photos of the cleared land, and the last picture of the new build with the obvious patch of grass where the basement would be. Hitchhiker on the Highway, Ghost Hitchhiker My parents, mom, and stepdad were both truck drivers. They operated as a team, meaning that they worked in the same semi and drove at different times. I lived with my grandparents most of my childhood, but some summers my mom would pick me up and we would go see the country as she worked. One day we were outside of Atlanta, Georgia, and we saw a car being worked on. It was a 2000s model Toyota that was beige in color. The odd thing about the people changing this tire was readily apparent to anyone who had eyes. They were all dressed in period-accurate Nazi uniforms. Towards the hood of this car, standing tall and looking out towards the interstate, was a man clearly meant to be Adolf Hitler. He was surrounded by two other men in what I assumed to be Nazi officer clothes. I would never claim these people to be ghosts. In fact, I'm almost certain that they were acting for maybe a reenactment or maybe a play or something. 
remaining in character on the interstate. I'm just saying that it was a weird thing to see and to start my day with, and that whole day was about to get worse. That night, my stepdad was driving, and I was restless in the passenger seat beside him. He's a cool guy, and we still talk to this day. He was talking about playing D&D with his buddies in the 90s, when I saw someone step onto the interstate in front of our truck. I pointed and said something urgently, and what he saw was only a second to try to stop, but we were clearly too late. A few seconds go by and we both noticed that there was no thud or feeling of hitting something. A few minutes pass and we both kind of chuckle it off as a weird occurrence. He turns on some music and tries to forget about it. I'm pretty sure, and our radio cut out abruptly very soon after and we hear a voice say, Alex is here. I'm actually spooked quite a bit by this, but he doesn't seem to be. I decided I was going to go try back to or go back to bed in the back. It took forever, but I did eventually get some sleep. At some point in the night, I jerked awake. I could still see him driving on the interstate, but I felt very uncomfortable, so I hid under the covers like a child. A few moments later, my covers were ripped off of me, and I saw a man between my stepdad and me. He was at least six foot three with a wrinkled face, gray hair peeking from under a do-rag, and he was smiling almost innocently. Regardless, I screamed. My stepdad looked back, and like that, the man was gone. I ran back up to the passenger seat and explained what happened. My stepdad laughed it off and told me, Truckers pick up spirits from accidents all the time. Your mom told me not to talk to you about it because it might scare you. But with the situation, I think you should at least know it's normal. Knives in the Kitchen, the multiple stories of one weird night at my mom's house. I was 15 at the time, and my mom was having a large family gathering at her house. I was invited because, while my mom and I weren't close, she had recovered from drug use for two or three years and was making a solid effort to turn her life around. Several of my aunts and uncles and cousins, nieces and nephews would be there, and at this point... My grandparents were pretty confident that my mother was actually trying really hard to reestablish a relationship with me. We weren't the best of friends, but I also didn't hate her either. I get there, and it's blatantly a fantastic time. The younger of us played in water slides, went on four-wheeler rides, had ice cream from an ice cream truck, and we were all a little bit tired by the end of the day. Then night comes. My mom put on the outsiders for us to watch while we were going to bed, because I think any sane human knows trying to get ten plus teenagers on bed in time is a wasted effort. I was exhausted, but unfortunately, I had battled badly with insomnia my entire life. It was 2.30 a.m. and everyone else was asleep. Someone knocks on the door to my room that we're staying in. I'm a little aggressive at this point, saying something along the lines of, It's 2 a.m., what? and a voice using a bad redneck accent responds, saying, It's your Uncle Mike. Grab a knife in the kitchen. I was kind of in it. I just kind of got jolted. But I did have an Uncle Mike in the house at that time, and he was an actual redneck. This was almost as if someone was held at gunpoint, and they told me to do a redneck accent, but physically weren't able to. They were also sounding like they were kind of choking on every word. So I simply decided I wasn't going to do that. No, it's 2 a.m. I'm not grabbing a knife from the kitchen, Mikey. I'd never called my uncle that, but for some reason the fear made me speak out of sync with my thoughts a bit. But we made a cake for everybody. You have to get a knife from the kitchen. Hell no, I thought. Mike couldn't cook anything other than bacon, hamburgers, and steaks. I opened the door and rushed into my oldest cousin's room, I think, and he was sleeping on a bed in the tent inside. Mr. Lonely was playing with a blue room light on. I locked the door behind me and slept with my cousin, who was in their 20s, and he was kind of rough around the edges. I slept in that room that night, only to wake up to accusations. My aunt, the one married to Mike, 
asked why I was banging on her door all night. I told her I wasn't. She said that I apparently, or said that at apparently a similar time that I went into my cousin's room, I banged on her door. She got dressed to open it. The door to my cousin's room was open, the lights were off, and no music was playing in the room. But no one was in there. When I told her my version of the story, she said it was impossible because Mike left for work at 7.30 in the morning. Or 7.30 to be at work at 8 p.m. And wouldn't be back until closer to 4 a.m. My older cousin who I slept with also had a different version of the story. Stating he woke up to no one in the room, but his door was open and he was looking down the hallway to every door in the hallway being open as well. He shrugged it off and went back to bed after locking his door. He had no explanation for how I got into his room without jimmying the door open. After some conversation with my oldest cousin, he whipped out a cell phone and started begrudgingly asking questions. When we heard nothing, we listened to the video, and as clear as day, a voice can be heard speaking, saying, My name is Mike, and I'm here. It sounded choking, but without a bad southern accent. Oops, I said it with a southern accent. Afterwards, my family decided it was a weird night and didn't bring it up again except in joking ways. Because what are you going to do about it? My mom and my aunt are very spiritual, but I'm a skeptic. I just thought I'd tell my version of the events. And yeah, my whole family thought it was weird that I heard a voice at the other side of the door. And when I opened it, no one was there. I never even thought about that aspect as a scared teen. The Ghost Cat Okay, so they all started when I moved into my apartment a few years ago. And just so everyone knows, I have a cat and a dog. But I got my cat in 2020, and I moved into the apartment in 2019. So, first when I moved in, nothing really happened, other than hearing meows, and when asking if anyone else heard them, they all said no. But most of this stuff takes place in 2022, 2023, because those are when the experiences were at their fullest. So first I would hear cat footsteps when my cat wasn't near. I would hear them under the bed, and when I checked under the bed, nothing was there. And no, I can't, can't really be my dog, because my dog's footsteps are way louder, and she was in my bed anyway. I would see a shadow of a cat, randomly. And once, I heard a sound of a cat playing with something, which I'm used to as my cat's very energetic and always plays with anything. And I was home alone, so I thought it was my cat, and it was in my big brother's room, just so you know, which is across the hall. I looked beside me and I saw my cat. She wasn't in that room. She was just sitting down on the floor. So I thought maybe my dog somehow did it. But it couldn't be her, as she was on the lap at the time. So I gathered all my courage I had to walk over there with my pets, of course. But when I checked underneath the bed, which was where the sound was coming from, nothing was there. I would hear random meows from random places that nobody else could even hear. I even saw that the cat was a black and white cat. This isn't the only paranormal experience, but my brother also had some. But this is just one that I really can't explain. I would also hear a cat jumping onto the bed. Once I even saw the cat so I know it wasn't mine, as my cat's black and gray, and only a little bit of white. Even if I was hearing and seeing things, but it wouldn't be possible for what happened a few months ago. A few months ago, I was sitting on my bed on my phone when I felt my cat going on top of me, which she does often, so I thought it was my cat, as I felt the weight of her and felt her going on top of me. So I looked up and saw nothing. Nothing was there. I only felt the cat going on me and not getting off. And I would see my cat in the corner of my eye if she jumped off. So this can't be explained. It's very weird, and I would always hear meows. And even see my cat meowing at nothing while looking up. I would always hear my cat's footsteps when she wasn't there. Even see a shadow of the cat or cats. 
and I know I felt it. I don't know what's going on, and I don't know whose cat that is. Why only I can hear it and see it is beyond me. Am I astral projecting or having visions? So to begin, I've had sleep paralysis since I was about six years old. But after looking back into all of it, I often wonder if it means something else. The first time I had it, I could barely move, and a woman approached me. She then began screaming over and over again, screaming the words, Murderer! And any time I would have this happen, I would wake up in beads of sweat, breathing heavily and either screaming or crying. The second time I was nine, and a young girl was on top of me, jumping up and down on the bed playfully, and suddenly something entered inside the room and began chopping her up with an axe. I could hear everything, her screams or crying. The third time when I was 13, it happened. I would see a man, and it suddenly feel as though I was being pushed off of a building and began falling downwards. The fourth time was when I was 19. I heard a loud argument and gunfire, later to find out that my apartment had been a place of a massacre two years prior. And recently, I was asleep in the family room, and on CNN, my mom had been watching about the Titan submersible being missing or something began to crawl on the walls. It was all black and let out this cry, and it began to crawl towards me. I called out for my dog, and he came toward me too, staring at me, then turned his head toward the creature and began aggressively growling at it and began going crazy. It then came towards me and made me face the television screen, and it whispered in my ear, They're not what you think they are. And my dog just kept going crazy, growling. But he's too afraid. What felt like hours, I finally awoke, to my dog laying beside me, staring at me and making sure I was all right. I've become convinced that maybe these aren't just sleep paralysis dreams, and maybe I'm full-on experiencing either astral projection, or maybe I really am crazy. It's been scaring me, because I never know when it's going to happen. It just happens, and I'm trapped there. A few of my personal stories help debunk. When I was younger, I used to hear a cat door slam, and I live in the middle of nowhere. And they all sounded from my driveway. The nearest house in that direction is about a quarter of a mile away. But with them being sort of too frequent and so loud that it couldn't be them, I would hear this nearly daily until I was about 13. And talking to other people around the world, they've also experienced this. The next event was late at night. I don't know what time exactly, but it was after everybody went to bed. When I heard my brother upstairs, upstairs is basically a glorified office room where my parents work on their hobbies. When I went up there, he was behind the wall, just makeshift wooden walls that just give us extra storage and an easy way to get back there. When he came out, he had these wide eyes and he said something. I can't remember what he said. My parents woke up and asked why he was up there, and he responded with, I don't know. I might be getting that wrong, as it was maybe six or seven years ago, but it was along those lines. I asked him about it a few years later, and he said that he didn't even remember why he was up there. When I was in eighth grade, I was asked to do a tour around the school for the sixth graders, and mid-tour, I heard someone yell directly into my ear so badly that I had to stop and recollect myself. But talking to the people, they helped me figure out that it might just be some form of schizophrenia that just goes off at random times. I never got checked for it though, so I don't know if it was the cause or not. Just two more. About a year ago, this fake snake that I found, I could chew on. I don't know why, but I felt like chewing on something all the time as it relieved stress. After having it sit on my desk for a few days, it randomly appeared in the bathroom hallway, poking out of some metal. We use metal to cover up the size of the bathtub, and it looks nice. I don't remember moving it, and I certainly don't remember poking into some metal. 
Last night, I got out of the bathtub, and when I walked into my room, I heard what sounded like someone saying something. I don't know, it sounded like a ah, uh, ah, uh, or an ooh. I don't know which one, but it was along those lines. And it was late, like 2 a.m. late, and no one else was awake except me. Something communicating with me through a light. I've been in a mentally bad space, but I'm okay. No need to worry. Two nights ago, I woke up at 2.40 a.m. in the pitch black. I was feeling like not being alive and begging and wishing for a higher power. I asked if I meant to be alive. For something in this room to move or something to happen. After five minutes, nothing happened, so I asked if... Someone could communicate with me through lights. I said in my mind, flash a light once if I should be alive, and flash it twice if I should die. After a couple of seconds of thinking this, the light on my Chromecast illuminated very brightly and made a white light on my wall. It stopped after one second and again flashed a second time and held the light. I came over to check what the light was, and it was my Chromecast. It's never so bright that I can light up a wall. After that, I sat back down on my bed looking at the light, and I said something in my mind. If the message is clear, and I should die, turn the light off now, and it immediately turned off. It's freaked me out because that light on my Chromecast is usually dim and wouldn't be that bright. It seemed like it can't be a coincidence that it lit up twice and stopped too. This isn't the first experience I've had with situations like this. I don't have anyone to talk to. I hope it's okay to post this here. It has been pretty confusing to me, as I never really expected a response or even thought it could be possible. Ask Reddit Over a couple of weeks years ago, Living with my ex while we were in the shower together, the bathroom door got knocked on extremely hard and aggressively. Got out and opened it basically straight away. There was no one there. No one was in the house, and all the doors were locked. We also had the cliche footsteps. And I remember one night there was this weird music coming from nowhere but still in the house. That was whack. A Friday night, maybe Saturday, it was years ago now, some teenagers from next door came and knocked saying that there was someone in the house with them. They were alone for the weekend, so my mates and I just plus them. My partner went out with them. We saw the lights go out all at once, but no one came out. The cops came and called for backup. They went through and found no one after looking for like 15 minutes. The thing is, though, unless whoever was in there could climb four meters in a few seconds... The only way to the street was past us. They stayed with us the night, and we never heard anything about it again. They also moved away maybe a month after, I think. The last thing that went down over the f those weeks was the one that fucked with me the most. I heard as clear as day my name said right behind me, and then footsteps above me while doing some early morning weekend work. I used to work in a very high security facility, and for someone else to be in the building, they would have had to been let in by me, and couldn't be in there before me as the alarms couldn't be deactivated without my fingerprint. I almost shit myself, and after talking with my boss on the phone, and checking that there really wasn't anyone else up there besides me, no cars besides my work car and my private car locked in the grounds with the other work cars, I bailed and never did Saturday mornings alone. After that, nothing ever happened and nothing before. I still think about those weeks all the time. Ask Reddit 2 My parents' house that I grew up in changed my belief at a very early age. We had moved from our old house into a new one when I was around four years old. I got to pick my room, which was on the top floor of a two-story house with a basement. My sister had the room across from me. 
I had a waterbed as a kid, which was nice, and warm blankets, lots of video games, and an overall very comfy room. I had always heard stories of ghosts from friends, but never believed any of it. When I was around eight or nine is when I started to question the stories, because I'd often wake up to an older woman standing outside my door at the top of the stairs. That became the name I knew her as. The first few times I woke up freaking out and waking everyone up in the house just yelling. The woman at the top of the stairs is watching me. My mom or dad would come into my room, tell me the typical parent thing that it's not real and to go back to bed, and eventually I'd fall back asleep. After some time, I began to shut my door at night before bed thinking it would help. I would still wake up in the middle of the night and see her feet directly outside my door. Then the next night, the door would be open and she'd be there. A few nights later, I woke up to my waterbed moving as if someone sat down. I was a tad groggy from just waking up, put on my glasses, and looked to see her sitting on my bed with her hand on my feet, which were under the blankets. I froze and she just sort of smiled at me. I could see the dip in the blanket from where she was sitting. Her hair was down, shoulder length and brown. She was wearing a flowing nightgown that looked a bit aged, but it was bluish in color. There was no doubt in my mind that she was there, but I knew if I yelled for my parents, she'd disappear. I eventually sat up, and right as I moved, she disappeared. I felt the area where she was sitting, and it was ice cold. I'd like to say that this was the first and the last time that it happened, but it wasn't at all. This would continue for years. To date at this house, I've heard someone say my name quite a few times when I've been completely home alone. I watched items slide to perfectly flat surfaces, seen multiple different ghosts there, animals, and had absolutely 100% inexplicable things occur. A friend that passed visited me a few times, watched items get dropped, thrown, lights turned off and on, TV off and on. I could go on, but this is already insanely long. I'm 38 now, married, kids, house of my own, and I still see things about every, every week in different places. For me, it's not a matter of if that they're real, because they're 100% real. But you just might not have seen one yet, or noticed the noises. Ask Reddit 3 Grandpa was more silent than your typical quiet Finnish man is. His reactions to things compromised mostly of scoffs and grunts, Very rarely did he let out a shy smile. It was over 11 years ago that he passed away, choking on his own mucus at night. He had throat cancer. It was bad, but he managed to survive it for a few years. The doctor had called my grandmother, saying that Gramps didn't have a lot of time left as such. The family went to the hospital to visit him one last time. Dad said I should stay in the car, so I stayed. I remember happily listening to The Lemon Tree by Fool's Garden on repeat the whole time, singing along to the cheery tune. Gramps died the following night. His funeral came and went, and life moved onwards. But I was sick with grief, blaming myself for not going and seeing Grandpa one last time. Exactly two years after Gramps had died, on the same day, on the dot, I had a dream. In the dream, it was Christmas time. My parents and I were going to my grandparents' house. Without even knocking on the door, my grandparents' dog, who had already passed on a few years before Gramps, jumped up at me and started licking my face. Happy that I got to see her again. I walked inside, took off the winter jacket and boots. Other family members that were there as guests came to say hi to us, but behind all of them I saw my grandpa. He rubbed his beard a bit, gave a sly smile and gestured for a hug. I ran up to him and gave him the biggest hug a child my size could have given. He smiled and felt just like he used to. His familiar Old Spice cologne mixed with a cigarette. He rubbed my head and told me to go wash my hands so we could play some cards before the meal. My great-grandmother, Gramps' mother-in-law, who was still alive, 
gave some crude remarks from the kitchen that Gramps was teaching me bad habits. I squeezed Gramps one last time before I went and washed my hands. Gramps sat up on the couch and broke out his favorite deck of cards. The shiny cards that were a bit too slippery for my small hands. Before he began dealing, Gramps held out his hand and showed me his thumb. It was for our small ritual for luck. We did it whenever I had a school exam or something coming up. I pushed my thumb up to his, gave it a big extra push. Gramps began dealing cards and before he finished, I woke up in my bed. Tears instantly started pouring out in the middle of the night. I still wanted to finish that card game with him, but never got the chance. I like to think that Gramps came to me in my dreams specifically to give me the closure that I never managed to get. I tried to post this last night and today, and the post failed. My family has a lake house with 90 acres that we go to vacation at periodically. It's my stepdad's family. His uncle Ken was an alcoholic and committed suicide in the basement about 20 years ago. The first time we came down here, my mom blew a tire on the way. The second time, my mom's dog died at home. The third time we came, my mom's other dog died on the property. And this time, when we went to leave, my dog started having our issues and died. Lots of strange incidents have happened in the past couple of times that we've went. I feel a weird energy here, and I feel like I'm constantly being watched. We were going to leave Thursday, but with the situation with my dog, we hung behind and let my family go, and we would all meet up with them later. Friday, which was yesterday, after my wife and I finally made it to the property, wanted to go walk through the woods and explore a little bit. I started walking down the trailhead, and about 150 feet in I started feeling disoriented and got a headache. I keep walking. After another maybe 400 feet, I hear a rustling in the bushes and almost a voice saying, turn around. I stop and listen for a couple times and I ground myself by realizing it's a bird. I walk maybe 30 more feet, the bird follows changes its tone, and shortened up the turnaround. And I walk another 50 feet and he lands on the tree in front of me and starts chirping with a very low tone and more pronounced. I got scared and turned around. Ask Reddit 5 on Black Friday, my wife let me at home with our sleeping kids, one and three years old. The one-year-old slept in our room so as not to disturb my other child. Around midnight, the youngest wakes up screaming bloody murder, so I go up and I start rocking him. He's falling asleep when I heard the telltale signs of a toddler's feet running on hard wood. As I look over, I see my son run into the dark room I'm in. I'm about to say, Hi, Nathan and I noticed it isn't him, but an apparition of a child. In the time it took my brain to process this, it disappeared into the ether. I tried to justify this as the light in the hallway playing tricks on me, but it was too real. My heart jumped nearly out of my chest when it happened. Since then, a few random things happened. I had a bottle of shoe polish fall on my head over a door, like the bottle was on a counter behind the door and the bottle fell on my head when I was next to the other side of the door. Random toys go off at all times of the night. This one is easily explainable, and I understand that. The final event was a few weeks ago. I went upstairs to use the bathroom, and my wife was at the bottom of the stairs in the living room. While in the bathroom, I heard a male talking outside the door. I assumed it was the TV. When I came out, she asked me if I was talking to her, and I said no, TV was off. We both heard a man's voice clear as day, talking in the upstairs hallway. The Knock Knock Ghost When I was 16 or something... I used to go every summer to my aunt and uncle's house in the countryside. 
I used to live in a city near to the desert, so it was pretty fun and refreshing to go. The thing is that my uncle is really good to tell stories and give them a fake ending. And I'm autistic, so I would realize that they were lies when something really extreme or unbelievable happened, or my sister directly told me that he was lying. But the stories weren't like in a compulsive liar kind of way. It was more like starting to tell a real story, but then exaggerate everything to give it a funny ending. So this one day we were eating fries and drinking Pepsi, although he was a little bit drunk because he was drinking beer too. My sister and I were with him, and suddenly his face became very serious and said that the story that he was about to tell was 100% true. I learned the hard way that I shouldn't take seriously what he said, so playfully I told him to go on. He started by telling me that when he was little, and his brother had his own room, so he slept by himself. The thing is, is that some nights would appear, what he called as, El Fantasma del Toc Toc. That translates to the knock-knock ghost. He would hear four knocks on the window and feel like someone was watching him. This happened pretty frequently and really scared him. I said something like, okay, you should stop drinking and go to bed. And I laughed. My aunt was with my younger sister on the bed because she was telling her story. And she sort of fell asleep, so I had to sleep in the big bed with my uncle. I remember that I was reading a fan fiction or something, and it was pretty late. All I could hear was my uncle snoring. I was really concentrated on what I was doing, but suddenly I heard four knocks on the window. I laughed out loud and said, You'll have to work harder to scare me, thinking that it was just one of my cousins trying to scare me because they heard the story or something. So I go back to, you know, reading with a smile on my face. I was laying down when I swear I felt a weight on my legs as if someone was sitting on them. I sat down immediately and looked to see if it was somebody playing a prank on me, but all I saw was my legs covered by the sheets. I panicked and bent my legs so I could hold them with my arms, but I couldn't. Until from one moment to another, the weight disappeared. I was shocked because I couldn't explain what had happened. I do believe in spirits and energies and stuff, but it had never happened to me. I'm a pretty logical person, so when something mildly paranormal happened, I would give it a logical explanation right away. But this time I couldn't. I convinced myself to just think that it was paranoia because the story that my uncle had told me. But at the time, I didn't believe him. I really thought that he was just drunk and messing with me. And the story didn't scare me, so I don't know how my head would make it up. Ask Reddit 6. My friend's dad and stepmom bought a really old house that was sort of like a cabin style home. I want to say that it was more than 100 years old because it looked like hell. They got it for dirt cheap and they had planned on renovating the place. My friend rarely stayed there because he said the place creeped him out beyond belief. He said at my house at least four nights a week during the summer and usually stayed at his mom's house instead of his dad's. The house was really weird and had some very bizarre construction to it. It had a staircase on the second floor and went to nowhere. It just ended at the ceiling, and for the most part, the house was all original, so it wasn't like there used to be a third floor. There was a dirt floor basement that looked like something out of a horror movie. It had a few small windows and no way to get into the basement from inside the house. You had to go outside the house and go through an exterior entrance. The house had been vacant for almost 10 years when they had bought it. This was around 95. And the previous owners had purchased the house with the same intent of fixing it up, but ended up walking away from the house and foreclosing on it. They had two border collies, Benny and Jet. The dogs were still young, so they were really rowdy. Being border collies tended to be destructive if they were not entertained. During the day, instead of leaving them unattended in the house, his stepmom used to lock them up in the basement so they had a decent amount of room to play. His stepmom came back from work that day, and usually the dogs would be barking because they would hear a car when she pulled into the driveway. 
but she thought it was odd that it wasn't Benny. Or rather, she thought it was odd that she didn't hear anything. She unlocked the padlock on the basement door and was greeted by Jet, but not Benny. Jet had blood all over his paws, and the basement door had scratches all over it like the dog had been fighting for its life to get out of the basement. Once Jet was out of the basement, he ran and wouldn't come near the house. She said she walked into the basement and couldn't figure out what it was, but the smell was awful. She couldn't find Benny anywhere. The basement was pretty much an open space with limited places for him to hide, but he was gone. When my friend's dad came home, they both went down to investigate again, and behind an old tabletop that was leaning up against the wall, they found a puddle of blood in about a five-inch section of what they think was Benny's tail. They never found Benny, could never explain what had happened. They took a huge loss on the house and sold it in less than eight months after they bought it. After the incident, the other dog became insanely neurotic and had major behavior issues. According to my friend's mom, the week they moved into their new house, he went back to normal. I was driving home from my then-girlfriend's house at around midnight. It was summertime and very hot, and it had rained earlier that evening, so it was kind of foggy. I had to drive down Route 17, which is a really old road that ran from where I lived to where she lived. It also passed through Burkittsville, the town where the Blair Witch Project came from. I was driving through the area that was mostly old rundown farms. The road has a lot of sharp turns in them, so you have to go slow. I was going through a turn and through the fog, and I all of a sudden see an old man walking across the street. I slammed on the brakes and braced myself for impact because I knew there was no way I was going to stop in time. I remember the old man turned and looked right at me as my car was about to plow into him. He opened his mouth and looked like he was screaming no, but as my car hit the area of where he was, it vanished. My car finally skidded and came to a stop. I wasn't sure what the hell just happened, and I didn't hear any thump on my car, so I immediately got out of my car and was just looking around for a body. I didn't see anything. I went to the front of my car, and I didn't see any damage. I walked behind my car a few feet and couldn't see anything. I must have walked about 40 or 50 feet and started to get freaked out. Then I heard what sounded like footsteps coming from the darkness. I pretty much almost shit myself by this point and I sprinted back to my car. I told my mom the story the next morning and just telling the story gave me goosebumps. My mom, who normally doesn't believe in the paranormal, looked at my arms and said, Just by your reaction, I believe you. The Girl in the Cal Gorley. Now this didn't happen to me, but it happened to my dad. He's not the kind to over-exaggerate or even believe in the supernatural, but this experience really shook him up. He owns a business that provides safety manufacturing for mining vehicles and the like, and he was on one of his sales trips down to a mining town in Cal Gorley, Western, Aust Western Australia, now, towns like these in Australia are old and remote and have a lot of strange feelings around them due to bloodshed with First Nation peoples and also miners during the gold rush in Australia and crimes that occurred around remote towns such as these. As such, paranormal encounters are not unheard of, and I believe my dad had one. He had got back late to his hotel room after a trip out to the mines. And he was exhausted, so he went straight to bed. At around 2 a.m. he heard loud voices and banging on the doors and sat up in his bed. The rooms are set out so that he could see his door directly from his bed, down to a small passageway. The noise ended abruptly, and he assumed it had just been some drunk FIFO workers or something, and was ready to lie back down when he saw something strange. The door to his room hadn't opened, but he could clearly see a young girl making her way down the short passage toward him. He couldn't see her features properly, as she was quite shadowy and her body seemed to cut off at the waist. 
as there were no visible legs. I was 16 at the time, and he described her as seeming around my age and height. She came close to his bed, and he let out a yell as he was terrified, and she seemed to disappear in front of him 